I've just said to someone, I'm really impressed there are so many people in this room and they, they kindly noted to me that the reception is following this session. <laughs> anyway, I am going to take it personally that you're all here and we've just discussed this. Wolfgang uh, really is the rock star here. I'm just the warm-up band. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of uh, basics around vaccine hesitancy, acceptance and demand. Some of you that have known me for some years will notice or recognize maybe a few of my opening five, six salvo of slides. But I think it's good that we're all on the same level before we get to the rock stars presentation. So we know what we're talking about when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, vaccine acceptance, vaccination demand, etc. So the first thing you'll note from this slide is that I'm not using the word vaccine hesitancy, I'm using vaccination hesitancy, acceptance demand. And that is because a lot of people actually hesitate or are critical, not only of the vaccines themselves, but of the services or the agendas of the services or the authorities that provide or present us with those vaccines. So vaccination hesitancy should be the word we'll be using here. The other thing I'm going to say right from the start off is that I really dislike the phrase vaccination hesitancy because it suggests that the problem is yours. The problem is not mine as the service provider. You are the vaccine hesitant parent. And in fact, it was in Eskida 10 years ago or thereabouts, Carl will probably correct me on this, in Berlin, was that? Was that 2009, 2010, where I made the same point about hard to reach communities and the fact that we should be using underserved instead of the terms hard to reach, because hard to reach actually suggests the problem is yours, you are hard to reach, and not mine, you are underserved. So I have slightly the same problem with vaccination hesitancy, but I'm going to move forward regardless because that's the um, uh, terminology we use today. And I'm going to start with measles as my basis for this introduction and these first few slides. A resurgence I think we're all familiar with across the European region. This is the WHO European region. This is the 53 member states of WHO that are depicted here in terms of the numbers, the aggregated numbers for measles and coverage. And as you're aware, this has been pretty widespread if you look at the 53 countries in the region. Typically, in previous years, we would see the east or the west of the region with a higher burden. These last two years, we've seen a pretty equal burden across, across the region, with the exception of Ukraine, of course, with a monstrous outbreak of over 80,000 cases. And perhaps more alarmingly, right now, we have a situation in terms of the measles and rubella elimination status of countries in this region, with four countries backsliding, one of those being mine, the UK, having lost its measles elimination status just this last year. These are the populations that are, uh, that are contracting measles in the, in the region, and I'm, I'm showing these, these slides for a purpose, which will be clear to you in a moment. And I think it's fair to say that measles is possibly um, the uh, equity virus, or at least a proxy of shortcomings in our programs and, um, and uh, weaknesses in our program delivery. It's a great proxy for highlighting or indicating where we have those programmatic weaknesses. And of course, the point I'm trying to make with all this is that whilst we all share the same aims, some of us have different opinions as to why this resurgence is taking place in the region. Some people believe that it's about the immunization program limitations and service delivery issues. Others would argue inequities in uptake, and others argue vaccination hesitancy or vaccination confidence, which has been a term that has been used almost synonymously with hesitancy recently, and I'm not sure that's been a positive thing. But, of course, what I'm going to talk about, what Wolfgang is going to talk about in a short, in a short while, will be more around vaccination demand and vaccination hesitancy. That is not to say that these other factors have not influenced what's happening in the European region today. When we talk about hesitancy, we've got to look at the whole spectrum. Um, since 1797, when Jenner inoculated Phipps, the eight-year-old Phipps in the UK, against smallpox, what we, what we saw was refusal to vaccine. We, we've had refusal, we've had uh, confidence issues for th the best part of 200 years. In fact, when people say to you, vaccination skepticism is old as vaccines themselves, they're incorrect. Vaccination skepticism was there before we started vaccinating. In the French, I've even recorded it 40, 50 years before Jenner 
vaccinated FIPS. So the arguments we're seeing today may be more interestingly around vaccine hesitancy and refusal and confidence and trust issues are much the same as they were then. There's not a lot of difference. The way we're communicating around those concerns has changed phenomenally. But the base arguments around vaccine safety, particularly in safety concerns, are much the same. We have this vaccine hesitancy, if you like, those that sit on the fence, that accept some, delay some, or refuse some vaccines, or vaccination service delivery. Um, and then we have passive acceptance and resilient demand. Passive acceptance, I would argue, is probably the dominant um, uh, driver of vaccination uptake in most countries. Most people, I would argue, vaccinate because everybody else vaccinates. It's not because we've done a really great job of educating every single last one of our, our families and every constituents. It's actually a social copying phenomena where we have a supportive healthcare worker community, we have supportive peers, we have supportive community. This is the norm. The majority of people vaccinate. So there's certain mimicking or social copying going on here, which makes our programs actually very vulnerable. Because when we have a crisis, People are unsure around vaccination because they haven't been informed or educated but have actually vaccinated because everybody else is. And I haven't got time to unpack that, um, but I'd, I'd love to come back and talk about that another time. That's inviting myself back already. Um, okay, and then we're going to talk about resilience, which is where I'm going to take this talk into an area of suggesting um, we should be focusing on resilience instead of firefighting, which I would argue we're constantly doing. We are constantly firefighting confidence issues, hesitancy issues that for the large part of the last 200 years have remained the same, but we just have a new generation of parents that we're trying to reach. So I talk about these three C's, and forgive those in the room who have seen these next three slides many times before, but my three C's I always come back to. We have an issue of complacency, convenience, and confidence. Three C's. Complacency. At a public level, if you don't see the disease circulating, you're less likely to vaccinate. Apathy sets in, complacency sets in. There's complacency at a healthcare worker level. If you haven't had a case of measles or have never seen one, you're less likely to know measles when it walks into your practice. There's complacency at a political level. If you don't know the true cost, both the human and the economic cost of an explosive outbreak, then you're less likely to invest in your immunization program and remain vigilant for vaccine-preventable disease resurgence. There's trust, or the second C, confidence. We know all about this. We're in a country here that has suffered confidence issues around vaccines uh, before, um, particularly around narcolepsy, but just across the, the border south of us, quite a long way south of us, but across a short bridge in Denmark. You ask your Danish uh, friends here in the room about H the HPV crisis over the last two, three years, and they'll tell you that confidence can really take you unawares. And I'm going to come back to the confidence issue shortly. And then you have convenience. Working parents, both working parents in most Western, Northern European, Southern European countries today simply don't have the time. Uh, we have various convenience factors. This is the third C, convenience. The user friendliness of our services is really questionable in some countries. Uh, there is a country particularly in this region that I always pick on, but I'm going to say it's probably representative of about seven countries of the 53 in the WHO European region where as some of you have heard me tell you before, the service is particularly inconvenient. And this is the story. You make an appointment with your GP. You finally get through on the phone, you get through to the GP's reception, and it takes you half an hour to make that appointment, but you make that appointment to vaccinate your child. You take the child out of the institution to the first appointment with your GP. GP gives you a vial, you take the child back to the institution, you take the vial back home and put it in the fridge, you make a second appointment with the GP, take the child out of the uh, institution, you take the vial out of the fridge and you visit the GP for one vaccine for one child. That's seven member states in the European region that have a system as such as that or very similar to that. So when we talk about convenience and the way in which we deliver our services, let's, let's make sure that we're first looking, or when we talk about hesitancy, let's first look at our services before we start apportioning blame on the parents who are hesitant. Because I would be hesitant in that situation that I've just described to you. If you've got more than one child, that's a part-time job. 
Yeah? That's pretty inconvenient. That's not exactly a user-friendly service. And then, of course, we have that the, 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 what falls out of my seas is pain management, which we, are, we often overlook. Um, but pain management, particularly the work by the Canadians, and Noni MacDonald is known to some of you, in fact, she's probably spoken here in previous years, um, is, is brilliant to talk more about this. But I wanted to note that because I think we've got to do more work. As a social scientist, I feel, as a parent of two children, I feel that we've got to do a lot more work around pain management and the uh, experience of vaccinating your children. When I take my kids to be vaccinated, it usually results in one of us crying, sometimes both of us crying. There is a negotiation before we get there, and it always results in me giving a little extra pocket money or an extra ice cream at the weekend or whatever it is. There is a negotiation. It's not pleasant, right? We've got to make it more attractive. This caption reads, putting on a brave face in front of the girls. That, that's his brave face. It's, it's my, one of my favorite uh, images. Anyway, so the point I'm trying to make is that the vaccine offer and the, vaccine, um, the vaccination offer is quite complex. There's a whole journey a caregiver needs to pass through to get to the final point of vaccination. And if they have more than one child, and of course just one child, they need to that repeat that behavior. So this is a fairly complex slide that I'm going to give you. You're going to have copies of these slides, of course. I'm not going to go through each of these. But all the way from the way in which we form an intention, a knowledge and awareness to an intention to vaccinate, and that's something Wolfgang's going to come back to shortly. Intention to vaccinate, our preparation to perform the behavior, we vaccinate, there's cost and effort that's related to that. Of course, point of service, and I've talked a little bit about that in the country that I just spoke about in terms of the convenience factor. Uh, and then after service, feedback, next steps, and then of course, back through this continuum. For, for, for other vaccines and for more vaccination. Um, so the journey to immunization is not very straightforward. It's not that an informed individual is a behaviorally responsive one. I hope we're all on the same page on this. The knowledge deficit model is inappropriate. It doesn't work. An informed individual, knowledge will not predict action. We could have spent an extra half hour in this session getting people walking around the room and I could have easily shown you that every single one of you has an example in your life where your knowledge does not predict your action. And anybody who's gonna have a glass of wine this weekend knows that it's bad for them, but I guarantee it's not gonna stop them from having maybe two glasses. Anyway, you get my point. Um, and of course, we have the, these mental shortcuts. I'll just, I'll just leave that up there for a moment. So this is Joan Caswell. Joan won the lottery shortly after hepatitis B vaccination. This is, something, this is something that Wolfgang's going to be talking about. Of course, there are these heuristics or mental shortcuts that we all have that make us jump to conclusions or often bias our behavior or our intention. I'm not going to dwell on this area, but it's an important area. It's one of the things, as I say, Wolfgang's going to be focusing on in his presentation, so I'm going to move on swiftly. So, this resurgence of vaccine-preventable diseases, can it be attributed to vaccine hesitancy? I frequently hear this. Oh, the problems in Europe are because of the lack of confidence. Well, I'm sorry, but all of the examples I've given you around confidence, around um, uh, 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 convenience, around complacency, are from this region, are from the EU. Never mind the 53 member states, are from the EU. The system I've just described to you going to the GP twice in the pharmacy, that's three EU member states. So when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, let's make sure we're, we're correct in making this assumption when we make this assumption. And I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's worked with vaccine hesitancy for 10 years, so I wish that I was at the sort of pinnacle and peak of this and was able to tackle vaccine hesitancy and all our problems would be solved, but they wouldn't be. Um, we have service delivery programmatic weaknesses. Social determinants are not so helpful in many areas of communicable disease prevention. We see a very clear correlate between outbreaks and social determinants. With vaccine preventable diseases, we're seeing that fairly weak relationship between social determinants in many member states. Um, vaccine safety management and response. I'm going to talk about Danish um, and Irish responses to HPV crisis of confidence in the next slides. Um, are we talking about hesitant parents of today or hesitant parents of yesteryear. Most of our cases for measles are over the age of 15. Over 50% are over the age of 15 of that 90,000 I just showed you for this year. 
an additional 21%, 22%, are too young to be vaccinated. So when we're saying that these vaccine-preventable disease outbreaks are due to the hesitant parents of today, and let's tackle the hesitancy today, I'm not sure we're quite clear. The epidemiological data would not necessarily support that. It could be often to do in many countries about service delivery weaknesses in the past or our sins of the past in terms of our programmatic weaknesses. Take, for example, uh, Italy, late second dose measles introduction in many of the provinces, now playing out in uh, older populations contracting measles in that country. And Italy's not an outlier here. This is similar to many of the EU member states. I'm not going to talk about mandatory policy um, and uh, where I stand on that point. It may well come up later, kind of, hope, kind of hoping it does in the questions, because um, uh, then I'll share with you my rather one-sided opinion on that. Um, so what could be a best return, better return on investment, Rob? What could we invest our resources in if we're not going to tackle hesitancy? If hesitancy is not to blame, how are we going to deal with this in the future? Well, I would argue that now is the time when we need a shift in perspective. Immunization is a best buy. 14 of 17 SDGs are addressed through immunization. And when we talk about universal health coverage, we talk about primary health care, we talk about uh, health security, without immunization, there's none of that. So I feel that now we're at a point where we could suggest a more challenging or, or challenge ourselves, maybe, to make an investment that is slightly different. We know that there's a strong economic return on investments. This is for Africa. I couldn't find data on Europe, but it's likely that it, it, uh, the ECDC and WHO may well have this data. But I just picked this up from Africa and found it astonishing, this, this uh, investment case that has been made from the African continent. The point I'm trying to make is that we really have a very strong and compelling argument to look at how we invest in tackling confidence and acceptance and promote demand for vaccines uh, today. So with my last three, four slides, I'm going to quickly focus on this resilience factor. So I think we could challenge ourselves to have a mission of building resilience. And I'm talking about resilience in the community, and I'm talking about resilience on our programs. So when I talk about resilience, I'm talking about the amount of um, change a system or community can undergo and still retain its essentially the same structure. The degree to which a system or community is capable of self-organization. And then thirdly, the degree to which a system or community expresses capacity for learning and adaptation. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that, but ultimately, if, a, if I'm arguing that if a community displays resilience, and, and we can promote resilience in communities, we are less likely when a little ripple of concern comes around our vaccination programs that it doesn't turn into a tidal wave, that actually the community itself is resilient to that murmur. We know that behavior is contagious. I've talked about this before. I've touched upon it already a little bit uh, now. We know that in these cases that are shown on the, on the, on the board here, in terms of uh, on the screen in front of us, um, that in the case of uh, countries affected by anti-vaccine movements, we've seen, we see great impact. The, country that, um, the two countries that I want to talk about as well here are Denmark and Ireland. Um, in Denmark, uh, a few years ago, HPV coverage fell off a cliff. And it fell off a cliff because of uh, uh, adverse events related to this vaccine, related to anxiety-related events in, the Dan in Denmark, uh, promotion by two particular media outlets, um, and, uh, and, and a series of media productions, both in terms of print, uh, print and in terms of um, a documentary that was produced. In Ireland, we saw a similar thing happen about the same time. Not the same uh, severity of drop, but in Denmark's case, because Denmark dropped from being the highest one of the one, if not the highest coverage of HPV in the world, to to well 90 to 16 percent in 18, 20 months, that's that's a severe crisis, right? Ireland didn't see the same, did quite the same dip, but it did see a considerable dive uh, due to the same concerns in its HPV coverage. The interesting thing here is, and I thought I'd deliver these slides given where we're stood, or well, I'm stood, where you're sat today, um, 
because the other Scandinavian... Oh, I was about to say Scandi countries, that was a bit... Scandinavian countries, the other Scandinavian countries did not see the same impact. In fact, given the fact that you've only got a, a six, what, five kilometer stretch of water between Denmark and, and, and Sweden, it's quite remarkable how little that uh, um, uh, situation impacted these neighboring member states. So I think this warrants somebody to really deep dive into what makes these programs I would argue, resilient to that concern. There's not enough studies on this being done at the moment. You could look at Sweden and narcolepsy as another example, how this didn't affect your other childhood vaccination or, or your childhood vaccination program, and how MMR actually in this country, and MMR links to autism, unlike other countries in the whole of Northern Europe, we did see a decline in Sweden, but not a phenomenal dip and a, far, a fairly quick elastic response uh, back to very high coverage of MMR in the region. You could argue the same for Canada today. We've got explosive outbreaks of measles in, um, in, in the US across the border for Canada. We don't, uh, in, in the US, we don't have the same in Canada. And uh, Canada, much the same uh, in terms of both the autism uh, concerns, but also most recently in terms of the, the measles outbreaks in, in the US. And I would argue that someone, again, needs to look at what makes that program and community resilient to those concerns. So, I'm not going to focus any, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to focus on these next uh, slides, but to say maybe we do need a slight shift to start not firefighting, but building in a future community of caregivers and a future community of providers. This is a horrible slide. This is probably the most horrible slide I have ever presented. But but I tried to dump a whole load of stuff on this slide that I thought, well, well, we actually have evidence that these factors build resilience, as I previously defined on a, on a slide a few moments ago. The one I wanted to focus on particularly is the last one, and it, these are my last two slides. The one I wanted to focus on particularly was schools. We're simply not using schools well enough around vaccination, and by this I mean that's the future parent. That's the parent of tomorrow. My kids leave school, they know about waste management, sexual reproductive health, they know about nutrition, diet, road safety, alcohol abuse, substance abuse. I talk to them about vaccines, and I use my younger one's phrase, that's uber cool. They think it's so cool when I start talking to them about how vaccines work, and of course I have to put that over very simply because I'm a social scientist and I don't really understand how vaccines work, but, but, I make this very simple and compelling argument for, for vaccines that they think is really exciting. We're not developing enough assignments and, and classroom education. We're not leveraging what we preach about all the time, this multi-sectoral support for vaccination. I mean, this would be the obvious entry point if you were to ask me. Um, so I, I think there's more needed to be done here. The, the references I've got at the bottom here are fairly compelling. I went through each of those papers from smoking to alcohol. It's very compelling evidence, there's very compelling evidence that this makes a real impact in terms of recall, recall of messages from 10 to 12 year olds, but also impacts behavior if you look at longer term cohort studies. So my concluding remarks before I hand over to the rock star um, are, this is complex, folks. This is not a question of a one-size-fits-all, oh, well, it's confidence in this factor, it's to do with trust, it's the anti-vaccine lobby's fault. They're too small a group. They affect others, but they are a very small group. The hesitants, the fence-sitters, they are our concern. We don't get into the sandpit and start throwing sand back at the anti-vaxxers. They'll never change. They'll always be there. Live with it. Work with the people who they influence. And I suggest to you and recommend to you today, and I realize a lot of future leaders are sat in this room today, so I would really compel you to think about a longer term investment so that in the future, when we have these, cri where a crisis does not emerge from a little concern or a minor blip in our, in our programs or a new paper or a rumor doesn't result in a tidal wave. Become not firefighters, but start building the house of uh, inflammable or non-flammable material so that it doesn't go up in flames when there's a small um, a concern. Because I would argue that's almost a better return on investment. Now, I made 
that I've tried to make a quite compelling argument for why we should have a longer term return on investment. That's not to say that we shouldn't continue what we're doing because there is some new science around vaccine hesitancy, which is really exciting. And uh, I t I, I'm, t I'm so happy to be stood up here and sat next to Wolfgang, because uh, I know what's coming. So, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there, and I'll thank you for your attention. The reception's coming soon, don't worry, just stick with it. We're, we're almost there. Thanks.